would like to ask a question, please raise your hand or membership card. I'm going to go to a very quick member in the middle. Yes, yeah, that's you. Um, would you like to... Starting things that way. Okay, so that way. Yes. Okay. Um, so Ben, your argument was predicated entirely on Hamas, but thousands of Palestinians, including hundreds of minors and children, are being held hostage by Israel without any charge, with well documentation of abuses, including sexual abuse, which Israel's own human rights organizations have reported. Hamas did not exist for decades after Israel's creation, and they're not in the West Bank. So, if you're going to be arguing about Hamas, how can we ignore that over 200 Palestinians have been killed, including over 40 children, making it the deadliest year for Palestinians in the West Bank before October 7th that does not even include the killings happening now, just in 2023? So what justification do you have for that if Israel intends to quote-unquote go after Hamas it's killing many people, especially children, under the justification of Hamas. So what justification do you have of them targeting the West Bank, even if we were to buy anything you said, which honestly, I'm questioning? Sure. So the casualties that have been incurred in the West Bank are prior to October 7th largely. There have been many since October 7th because there have been many conflagrations between the IDF and the Palestinian Authority and Islamic Jihad members in the West Bank. There's significant violence over the course of the early part of this year. There's a, a breakaway group from the Palestinian Authority. It's called the Lions. The Lions were a small terrorist cell, the Lions then. They were committing acts of terror in places ranging from Jerusalem to areas of the West Bank. And the IDF was going in and making operational decisions to kill many terrorists in these areas. There are many areas in the West Bank that have been particularly infiltrated by terrorism. That The city of Janine would be probably the, the example of, of the place that has been most infiltrated by terror groups. It's unfortunate, but Hamas is not the only terror group in the region. Palestinian Islamic Jihad is an excellent example of another terrorist group that has wide presence in the West Bank, more so actually than Hamas. There's a Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket, obviously, that fell on that Gaza hospital that the entire world then tried to blame on Israel. Okay, I'm allowed to respond, right? Go ahead. So if your entire argument, once again, is predicated on terror groups, what response do you have about the Great March of Return, which is a very well-documented <coughs> incident where peacefully Palestinian civilians just march to their own land that they have a right to go and return to, but they were killed, shot at, and murdered in cold blood. What year are we talking about? Which group are we talking about? I need more specificity. I'm talking about the Great March of Return. I know I'm asking for more specificity because I'm unaware of all the details of what you're speaking about. So the Great March of Return is a well-documented instance where many Palestinians, after a tweet by a Palestinian, encouraged other Palestinians to go march peacefully back to their land. Which so land is theirs? What are we talking about? We're talking about occupied Palestine. Are you talking about in proper Israel? Where are we talking about? Like which areas? We're talking the, uh, we're talking about on the borders of Palestine, and we're also talking about their right to return to Palestine. There is no right to return. If you're talking about in Palestine, if you're talking about the land that is inside the 67 borders, there is no right of return to Haifa. There's no right of return to Tel Aviv. There's no right of return to West Jerusalem. So you have to remember that there are many, many, many elders who are older than the state of Israel. You have to remember that Palestine is not a Muslim land. You are equating this to a religious conflict. It's not. When Palestine, before it was occupied, you had Jews, Christians, and Muslims peacefully coexisting. Palestine is not a Muslim homeland. It's a land that existed where many people that are alive to this day are older than the state of Israel. So are you making the argument that any population of any time, all of their descendants now have a right to go back to the place that their great, 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 great grandfathers went? Not and, great, and, great, great. Grandmothers okay, grandmothers, grandfathers. grandfathers. Is that the idea that you, get, you can walk across the lines of any sovereign state and simply claim the place that you said that you had, even though you never established property rights in, say, the Jordanian West Bank, or you abandon this place in Haifa? So your, your, your claim is that right now people get to walk across the border of a sovereign nation and simply set up shop in Haifa? This is your claim. 
So if you're, okay, so even if you were to buy what you're saying, which is obviously not true, I encourage you to Google about the Great March of Return, which was a peaceful resistance against the wrongful occupation of Palestine. Even if you were to buy what you were can, saying. Can you just define like, wrongful occupation? Which part of Palestine is occupied? I mean, I'd like you to answer mine. I gave you an example of peaceful resistance. I yes. I gave you an example where people were wrongfully shot at, including children, and you still can't answer about why that's justified. So, if you, are, again, if you I... keep talking about Hamas and terror groups, and you gave examples of other terror groups, even though I gave you examples of civilians who marched and were shot at. But even now, a few days ago, you had Palestinian people living in Israel proper, which is occupied Palestine, who are being shot at by farmers on their, in their gardens and in their farms. And those people are being able to get away with shooting them with total impunity. So why is it that That's, that's not true. Many, many of those people have been arrested. They're all currently sitting in Israeli jail. The settler that just shot at a Palestinian have been arrested. was not arrested. I encourage you to look into this. I, I did look into this this morning. And as far and can I please get one answer before you leave? Because this is an interesting conversation. Which part of Israel is occupied at Palestine? There we go. There we go. There we go. So what you're calling for is the obliteration of the state of Israel, and all of this is just a cover for that. I appreciate your time. And now, like today, we put in Thank you, and may I first say thank you for coming to speak to the Oxford Union this evening. It's a real pleasure. Um, I'm a theology student myself, and I was wondering, how do you reconcile your conservative political views? Say into the, into the microphone. Sorry, yes. Yeah. Um, how do you reconcile your conservative political views um, with the religious values of compassion and your, your own Jewish faith? And uh, your, your stance on the Israeli and Palestine war? I, I don't see why it's uncompassionate to call for the overthrow of Hamas, a terrorist group in the Gaza Strip, which has been oppressing its people and stealing billions of dollars from its own people. Ismail Hayyemi is living in a five-star hotel in Qatar while his people are living in absolute misery because of a war that he initiated by killing 1,500 people inside Israel proper and then taking 233 hostages. I don't see why that's non-compassionate. It seems to me that compassion also requires that you obliterate terrorist threats to your own population. Thank you. Um, okay, so remember you turn on here. Okay. Can you all hear me? <laughs> all right, what about now? Uh, um, sorry, we'll be, we'll be okay, I'll speak up, I'll try my best. Um, hello, Ben, it's, it's good to see you. I've been watching you since 2015. You started my conservative journey, and um, <laughs> here we are. Um, I saw, unfortunately, you had to bring some pretty gruesome photos and uh, I have to say, I hope those photos aren't real, and I have my doubts because recently you posted an AI-generated image of a charred infant corpse. No, I didn't. That is a lie. That is untrue. That's it was not an AI way. photo. It was not an AI photo. It was distributed by the Israeli government and the Prime Minister of Israel. It was verified by the United States government. That fake community note that said that it was an AI-generated photo was, in fact, taken down by Twitter because it was a fake community note. That is, unfortunately, not an AI-generated photo. I wish it were. It was, a, it was a baby obliterated beyond recognition because it had been burned to death. So is it, is it the word of the IDF in Israel versus the word of... No, actually, no, actually it's the photo, it, it's, it's the actual camera footage taken by GoPro cameras by Hamas terrorists as they invaded Israel proper. I don't have to take Israel's word for it. A lot of this stuff was live streamed. So to, to what extent, as, as you're posting to social media... Are you willing to make sure the information you're posting is, is accurate um, to not exchange the truth for um, giving aid to Israel? I'm certainly doing my damn best. I mean, there's a lot of information flowing around. I'm, I'm doing my best. On that one, for sure, 100%, it is a lie that that is an AI-generated photo. That is not true in any way, shape, or form. And it, shows how the, it does show how... We live in a very dangerous era where anybody can, I mean, this is happening on a routine basis. You're seeing, for example, some of the pictures, there are, there are horrible pictures coming out from Gaza, and a huge number of those are, of course, absolutely real. You're also seeing people who are repurposing pictures that are taken from Syria and then saying those are happening in Gaza. So, yeah, unfortunately, there is a lot of information that's floating around that 
is hard to kind of lock down and verify. That picture is 100% real, unfortunately. I, I sympathize with you because as AI gets more advanced, it becomes increasingly hard to discern information. So I know you bear a lot it's, of it's, and I mean, this is going to be a serious problem as time goes on. Seriously, like the flow of information is going to be more and more uncertain because of that. That I agree with on a general level. Awesome. Thank you for your time. Let's go to the member in the back. Yes. Sorry, it was the member behind you. It was the member at the very back. Yep. I'll come to you after. Um, hi. If Israel is justified in killing civilians because of the acts of terror committed by Hamas, why isn't Hamas justified in doing what it did? Because Israel is keeping 13,000 children. It has tried them in military courts. Since the establishment of Israel, 55,000 Palestinian homes have been bulldozed. So why isn't Hamas justified in doing what it did, if we use your logic? Um, well, so I'm going to answer your question, and then I'm going to ask you a question, if you don't mind. Is that all right? So, the, the, so my answer is that Israel would not be justified in killing Palestinian civilians because of the actions of terrorists. Israel would be justified in attempting to kill terrorists, and civilian casualties are a cost of war. That is just a reality of life. During World War II, there were 70,000 Brits who died during the Blitz bombing, and there were 2 million Germans who died, civilians, who died during World War II. And I don't see a lot of monuments in Britain because of the 2 million civilians who died in Germany. The costs of war are brutal. They are terrible. They're horrifying. There's a vast difference in moral scope between deliberately going into a civilian area and murdering everyone you can find and trying to kill a terrorist who is deliberately hiding beneath a civilian area, hiding their rockets in civilian areas, starving their own people. There is a vast difference. Okay, so let me, now I get to ask my question, if you don't mind. So my question is, do you believe that there is a moral difference between Hamas going into, for example, Kfar Aza and murdering entire families and Israel attempting to target terrorists and accidentally hitting civilians. Israel is effectively doing the same because Gaza is the most densely populated region in the world. There are 15,000 people per square mile. So does Hamas get immunity because the they're there? So Hamas gets immunity. So Israel, if you, Israel has killed 3,500 children in the past three weeks. That's so, more children. That's more children than have died so, in conflicts around the world in each of the last so, four so just, years. So just to be clear, your logic is that if you're a terrorist group located in a densely populated community and you hide behind civilians, you're now immune. Where are the children meant to go? So you're immune. Okay. That's Where a violation of the Geneva go? Conventions, but okay. You're, you're 20, now immune. Your no, logic is that if you're a Hamas terrorist... Sorry, sorry, since 2005, 23 out of every 24 conflict deaths have been Palestinian. I don't see any moral equivalency there. It's clearly unjust what the IDF has been doing to the Palestinians because there's a vast disparity between the number of Palestinians being killed and the number of Israelis. I mean, I would the certainly hope that Israel is, is killing more Hamas This isn't members. a conflict. I've... This isn't a conflict. This is one-sided ethnic okay, cleansing. So, again, I'm just asking you, if based on the numbers, more Germans died than Brits in World War II, did that mean that British, the British were wrong in World War II? Because they did. Many more Germans died than Brits. Based I... on the numbers, did that mean that Britain was wrong in World War II? Britain wasn't bombing civilian, civilians. There's a clear you, you difference. Should, you, should talk to, you should talk to the people in Dresden, but there's you can't because they're dead. There's a clear difference. Well, I agree that war is horrible, but this is not a just war. What Israel is doing is not a just war. There is a difference between Wait, fighting uh, the on. Nazis. So it is, so it is not a, a just war. to it, fighting the Nazis. It is, not, it, is not, it is not a just war when you fight a war against people who murder 1,500 of your civilians and take 233 of them, at last count, captive into tunnels. It is not a just war to obliterate them. Please Isra name a just war. Israel's been killing civilians for the past 75 years, and there was no headlines about it, and there was, nobody said that the Palestinians were Israel justified Israel does not purposefully kill civilians. Palestinian terrorists do. Israel has if, not purposefully if Israel killed put down civilians. Its guns Are you willing tomorrow, to stand by a, that statement? If Israel put down its guns tomorrow, there would be a second Holocaust. If the Palestinians put down their guns tomorrow, there would be a Palestinian state. That is the reality. And let me ask there you this. There would not be a Palestinian... I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you... I'm going to ask you... This, I'm going to ask you... This, I'm just going to ask you the last question, the same question I asked her. Which part of Palestine is occupied? 
the entirety of Palestine. But there we go. I'm not Thank calling you once for again. the destruction of Jews. I appreciate, I appreciate you expressing your full genocidal intent why, for the Jewish people living between the rivers. Why is it genocidal to call for a state that is not apartheid? You can have a state where all citizens have equal rights, Jews and Muslims. Oh, I'm, I'm sure that's going to go that's amazingly. That's not genocidal. Under the, under the same people who are governing the Gaza Strip, where currently oh, yeah. zero can Jews can live. The time. Can we move on to the next uh, question, please? Um, <laughs> let's go to I think the member in the green jumper. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I thought I was green. Yeah. Yep. The other view. Um, ben, it's an absolute displeasure to see me standing. <laughs> well, it's absolute... I will get to my question, however. Thank you for coming uh, anyway. My displeasure. Now, I'll repeat the, the question that I, I sought to ask you. Um, you have recently been discussing a lot about the history uh, of the occupation of Palestine, I will call it that. I know you will oppose that, but I will call it that. The occupation of Palestine. The whole thing, right? Just to be clear? The entirety of Palestine. Thank you. You okay. may accuse me of genocide if you wish. That is not my position. Sure. But... And I will, but go ahead. <laughs> anyway, so the, the point about the occupation of Palestine, you have released multiple videos. You have uh, essentially made, it, made yourself the cheerleader of Israel in a lot of sort of Western media spaces. So. I watched some of your videos about the conflict and I found uh, a number of inaccuracies. First of all, you describe in 1920, you refer to Jordan as part of Palestine historically. That has never been the case. There has never been a state of Jordan. British mandate Palestine, yes. That is still not the case. Jordan has never been part or considered part of Palestine. The only, part, only time that Jordan has been considered adjacent to Palestine is part of sort of biblical mythology where Transjordan was a reason. That's wildly inaccurate. The that British, man, the British mandate was had a mandate over Please, all of Palestine continue. and then they separated off Transjordan and handed it to ben, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. You will get your chance to reply, let me finish. Now, my second <laughs> point, my second point, the second point that you have phrased constantly and consistently, and it's quite a popular Zionist talking point, is the fact that the Arabs have rejected peace every time it was offered to them. Now, I would like, of course, there's been multiple times where peace has been offered, so let's discuss some of them. The Peel Commission. The Peel Commission entailed expelling multiple Arab families and multiple Arab communities, largely agrarian, from the land in order to create a Jewish state under a colonial authority. Now, I understand, of course, you are a Zionist, so you believe that's desirable. But for the Palestinian farmers, I can imagine they would not have enjoyed that. Number two, you mention that the, um, um, what's it called, that after 1948, the Arabs had the chance to negotiate and make peace with Israel. Apart from the fact that in 1956, Israel invaded the Sinai in Egypt, unprovoked, purely due to the fact that President Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal. Then you claim that the 1967 war was a war of extermination. But if you will read any trusted and respected historian over the 1967 war, and perhaps you may even decide to read some of the books of Moshe Dayan about the actual conflict, where he describes that Israel actually provoked the conflict and there was no chance of the extermination of Israel. Then you claim that the 1973 war was a war of the destruction of Israel once again, which it was not. It was actually the reclaiming of the Sinai and uh, the Golan Heights, which Israel has illegally occupied. So. You have lied multiple times. I can continue if you would wish, but I would like to ask you the question. When you lie, do you feel shame? Okay, so. In order for me to feel shame, I would have to be lying as opposed to you just being wrong about all of these things which you are. So let me start from the very beginning of what you said. Let's try to go through the calendar. British Mandate Palestine was ruled by the British. They carved off Transjordan in 1920, and Transjordan was made into Transjordan with the Hashemite Kingdom, which, by the way, is not domestic to the actual area of Jordan. So if you're talking about a colonial outpost, Jordan would be it, since the Hashemite Kingdom has nothing to do with the actual Palestinian Arabs who are living in Transjordan. Talking about the Peel Commission, if the idea is that there would have to be a separation of populations in order to effectuate a two-state solution, which you deny, then I was right. Of course, there was a deal on the table. The Jews accepted it. The Arabs rejected it. So you did 
did not actually David undermine Ben-Gurion my case. In his diary, should be no deal in David the first place. in his diary states. Yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I listened to your whole bullshit history for like five minutes here. So at least let me respond to it. Your entire claim is that the Arabs did not reject peace, and then in your own disquisition, you admitted that the Arabs rejected the Peel Commission plan, which was a separation between the Jews and the Arabs, which gave an extraordinary amount of land to the Arabs. The Arabs then rejected the peace partition plan proposed by the United Nations in 1947. They then proceeded to reject the Oslo Accords in 93. After that, they rejected the Wye River Accords in 98. They rejected Ehud Barak's very generous offer in 2000. They rejected Hul Umert's, Umert's very generous offer in 2008. Every single peace deal that has been proposed by Israel or anyone else has been rejected by the Arabs for a very simple reason, which was the very first question I asked you. You do not accept that there should be a Jewish state anywhere in this region. So as long as that's the case, there's literally nothing to argue about. You cannot simultaneously maintain the position there should not be a Jewish state anywhere in the region and then tell me that I'm wrong when I say that the Arabs will not accept a two-state solution. You yourself say that there should not be a two-state solution. Mm. So the, fir the first point that you, the, I'll firstly address the last point that you made about the um, Palestine and whether there should be a Jewish state. Um, the point you are making there is you're suggesting that the Arabs will not, will not accept a Jewish state. Well, the reason that the Arabs would not accept the Jewish state is multifaceted. Ah, it's complex. Let me finish. So, the reason that it's multifaceted is due to a variety of dynamics. The Zionist movement arrived as a settler colonial project, and it is described as that. You can read the books of Jab Jabinsky. You can read Zionist literature from the early 20th century. It states that it was a colonial project. Now, let's address the lies that you mentioned. Let's address the refutation that you made. In 1937, the Peel Commission, if you read the diaries of David Ben-Gurion, he explicitly states that the partition, sorry, thank you, that the partition was a temporary move to ensure the conquest of the full land. In 1948, there had already been an intercommunal civil war in Palestine, which had seen Jewish defense forces versus the Arab forces. There was already a conflict that preceded 1948. To claim that the Arabs simply rejected the UN partition plan is once again a historical. You then make- They the literally rejected it. How could it be a historical if they literally rejected it? If there was a war beforehand, and I get, if there again, was a war once beforehand, again, you just reject fundamentally the existence of the state of Israel, period. When so I how can- I attempted to interrupt you, I was told to silence. So I would ask you again, please shut up. My point now, I would like to continue. I would like to continue. And you then mention the, uh, what was the peace plan you mentioned after? I, I will okay, which you. one should we do? Should uh, we do the, should we do well, the? We, we finished 1948, what after? Okay, so there was the 2000 peace plan from Ehud Barak, okay. there was the 2008 peace plan from Ehud Olmert, there was a pull out of Israel okay. from Gaza Strip in 2005, okay. handing it over to Hamas. Let's get the next person up now. I All right, think. Um, thank you very much. Let's, 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 one final note, there can be no two-state solution when literally you will not accept the possibility of a two-state solution. That is the end of the story. There is no further discussion. So let's get the ex-president on the front bench. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Ben. I'm not going to ask any questions about um, uh, Israel-Palestine, but I wanted to ask something about what you talked, touched on in your opening remarks. Uh, you said that the reason you feel called to speak out, one of the reasons you feel called to speak out about what's going on in Gaza at the moment uh, is that you think that it is a question about the West standing up for its values uh, and uh, asserting its uh, identity and knowing what it is. Um, I put to you that perhaps the reason that that is so controversial, and you saw 100,000 people marching in London on Saturday, Saturday before, Saturday before that, etc., is that the West or many countries in the West no longer have a sort of common sense of what they are as nation states and therefore what they should stand for. Um, do you think that's true? Yes. And what do you think the consequences that are? I mean, I think the consequence of that is dissolution of the West. I mean, if, if the West is not going to be muscular in defense of whatever it believes its core values to be, then of course it's going to be overtaken by alternative sets of values. Is it the replacement of the West if it just adopts a new value code? Yes. I mean, if, if the West is to mean anything other than a location, it's going to have to mean a set of values. And those values traditionally in, in Britain have meant things like classical liberalism. They've, been, they've meant things like freedom of religious worship. Uh, th these are all aspects of the Anglo, now Anglo-American system. 
uh, that have been adopted across the pond as well. And when those values fall away, what you end up with is a morally relativistic state that, that cannot stand up for its own values and has no reason to, to continue. So do you think that collapse of a communal moral code is now inevitable? Uh, not at all. I don't. In fact, I think that there is going to be a, a, quite a backlash to the insane bl self-blinding that has taken place by the West. This belief that everybody is uh, at root thinking the same sorts of thing and, and engaging in the same sort of incentive structure. I do not think that that is the case. I don't think the West always believed that. This is not to say the West is perfect, that the West hasn't made enormous and horrifying mistakes. The West certainly has. But the West value system is certainly better than the other value systems that have been avail made available to the planet over the course of the last couple of centuries. I, I'm sure you'd agree with me in that the foundation of a lot of the moral code of the West is sort of Judeo-Christian. Do you think that mass secularization post the Second World War, at least in the United Kingdom, it's been much more delayed in the United States? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, I, I think that, that the religious Judeo-Christian values that have been you know, brought into the secular world by... Uh, by a diverse society, and then and this sort of secularized in, in terms of the way they've been embedded in our laws. Yes, I mean, I think a lot of the Enlightenment values that originally had their roots in Judeo-Christian culture, uh, I think those are beginning to wear away. I think that, that we're suffering from a, what, what one author called the cut flower syndrome, that, that if the idea is the Judeo-Christian values have to undergird a system of Western liberalism where there has to be a common agreement in terms of the things that we hold dear and the kind of good that we hold as the highest good in order for there to be room to stick and move within that good and toleration of minorities and, and the marginalized within that same framework, it has to be an agreed upon framework. When you cut that off from its fundamental religious roots, it's very difficult for, for the flowers to survive. They can survive for a little while in water, but eventually they wither. So if you don't Thank think, you. Claire, one more question very quickly. Fine. Thank you. Um, <laughs> if you don't think then that the uh, loss of a common moral code is inevitable, do you therefore think you'll see massive, rapid desecularization of the West? I think that you will see that. I, I do think that you're going to see people seeking community. I think that we've seen extraordinary isolation of people, atomization of people. This is particularly true during COVID. And I think people are seeking a sense of community. I think, unfortunately, many people are seeking community in political movements, which is quite dangerous. Uh, atomized individuals tend to band together in revolutionary movements. But I think the substitute for that would be to re-engage with a lot of the local and important institutions that used to provide the foundation for a happy life for people. And those traditionally were family, church, synagogue, mosque. Right? I mean, th those would be the things that people engage in. Thank you. Um, I bet there is a the So it's on the, the member to the right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. I wanted to ask you a question about the American political climate. So your analysis of the previous two American presidential elections and your forecast for the upcoming 2024 election is that the candidate against whom the election is a referendum will lose. Do you think this is an inevitable consequence of America's two-party political system or just a recent trend caused by the nature of candidates offered to the American electorate? No, I think it's probably an inevitable consequence of a two-party trend. I think it's very difficult to, to think of a, of a presidential election that was a positive referendum on the candidate. Probably the last one in America was 2008, where people positively voted for Barack Obama because they thought of him as a transformative figure. But that's a rarity. The, the usual nature of politics is sort of negative in orientation. And so I, I don't think there's anything unnatural about that. My only call has been that both parties should, should nominate somebody who's sane. The first party to rationality in the United States is likely to win. Unfortunately, we have, on the one hand, a geriatric doctrine, and, and on, the, on the other hand, uh, we have uh, Donald Trump. So uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the American people chooses its own candidates. And, you know, as H.L. Mencken said, the American the democracy is the theory that uh, the, you, you ought to get what you deserve, the American people are about to get what they deserve good and hard. So that, that is what it is. So on that note, do you think that the states would benefit from a stronger third party like we have in the UK or in Canada, for example? I don't think that the system lends itself to it very well because again, it's not a parliamentary democracy. I mean, the, the, the idea in the United States is, is very much built around this sort of binary two-party system. It's very difficult for a third party to make serious inroads. What we have seen over the past few years, it's a lot easier to take over one of the major parties. Trump effectively took over the Republican Party from the inside and changed it around himself. And you can see something similar that could easily happen inside the Democratic Party. Actually, Bernie Sanders has been quite successful in moving the Democratic Party significantly further to the left than it was even 10 or 15 years ago. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let's go to the member in the right hand Yeah.
Oh, man. Um, yeah, I, I've also, also watched you from uh, 2015, but then, like, I grew up. Uh, <laughs> I, I became a lefty, but, um, yeah. So I wanted to ask, um, so you're one of the more common-sense Republicans out there because you're not a complete Trump fanatic, right? I think you support Ron DeSantis, is that right? In the current primaries, yeah. yeah I'd vote for DeSantis in a yeah, primary. Very yeah. good. Um, so, yeah, so I was thinking, why do you not, let's say Trump wins, why do you not come out and support Biden? Because uh, what are you, you clearly don't like Biden, right? And, you know, everyone has their own political views. But Trump seems to me to be a fundamentally uh, serious threat to American democracy, which Biden simply isn't. Uh, so Trump, Trump's called for the suspension of the Constitution, and he's facilitated a, an insurrection. Biden's in neither of those things. He's been fairly milquetoast president. So why don't you uh, endorse Biden? So I disagree with some of the premises of the question. So number one, as far as Donald Trump being a serious danger to democracy, I think in the best of his imaginations, he probably would be in many ways. But this constitutional system is extremely durable. January 6th was not, in fact, a serious threat to American democracy. It was a serious threat to American order. It was not a serious threat to American democracy. There was no point in time on January 6th where there was a real possibility that a military coup had been launched and Donald Trump would retain the presidency after January 6th. It just was not going to happen. So the institutions of the United States and the legal institutions remain quite strong and were able to hem in whatever Donald Trump's peculiar desires are on the one hand. On the other hand, there are different types of threats to democracy. So Joe Biden, for example, has used the power of the executive branch in new and exorbitant ways. Most obviously, for example, when you tried to use OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety Administration, he tried to use that to cram down, for example, policies of Donald Trump, the stuff that he actually did as president, not, not the crazy tweets and the, and the nutty stuff that he says all the time, but in, fa in what, what he did in terms of the economy, what he did in, in terms of foreign policy, I'm obviously much more in alignment with his actual political positions than I am with Joe Biden. As far as the threats of democracies, as I say, one is more subtle and one is more obvious. And in some cases, the more obvious is actually the easier to reject. Well, I don't know. This, this position seems quite strange to me because you've, you've essentially conceded that Trump does not believe in American democracy. He doesn't believe in American institutions. But I think he believes in Trump and pretty much nothing sorry? else, yes. I, I think he believes in Donald Trump and not much else. Yeah, precisely. And, but, okay, sure, he might not be able to create the, the Trump dictatorship, but is it, is it really healthy for a democracy to have, have a leader in charge who does not believe in any of America's institutions? You know, say, any, say what you like about Biden, but he is proudly American. He believes in the institutions of America. Surely, surely you should support him over this, this egomaniac. Well, I mean, I don't think he actually believes in some of the institutions. I mean, he's attacked the, the Supreme Court would be a good example. He's attacked the Supreme Court with alacrity in the aftermath of the overruling of Roe versus Wade, for example. His party has talked about packing the Supreme Court. When it comes to the use of the... He's the, not packing it, though. His, his party has talked about it, right? He, he, you're right, him, he has not. not and Donald Trump talked about a lot of stuff, and that hasn't materialized either. So again, would I prefer that all of these candidates go away? Absolutely. I prefer all of these candidates go away. That's why I say first party to sanity wins. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, that's fair enough. I think, I think that position is very untenable, but I'll, I'll leave it out. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think we'll take one final question, uh, one final question before we wrap up. Let's go to the member in the front here. Hi, Ben. Uh, so good to have you. I wanted to go back to the current conflict, and I was wondering, given that obviously there's one side which does have you know, a respect for human rights, as you pointed out, they try to go about their response, Israel tries to go about their response in, a, you know, in the best way possible, um, at least I would argue, and you've got another side that has a fundamental, fundamentally different alignment of values that does not have regard for the civilian lives, and in purely practical terms, that makes it quite difficult to wage war in, an, well, in a civilized way, as far as you can say that. So in terms of perhaps drawing a potential, I don't want to call it path to victory, but a path to defeating Hamas, but reconciling that with our values and you know, killing as few civilians as we can. What, and I understand that you, you know ben, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and so on, so could you draw a possible sort of realistic path to victory that might reconcile? So I'm not, I'm not privy to the sort of military planning of, yeah. of the Israeli administration. Um, I'm not in their security councils. Um, what I will say is that 
any position that Israel takes that does not end with Hamas off the board is going to be extraordinarily dangerous for the future of the state of Israel. So that is the end goal. Everybody understands that to be the end goal. It's, it's dangerous not only because Hamas has proved itself to be significantly more dangerous than everybody assessed Hamas to be, but also because that leads to a perception of Israeli military weakness and inability to protect its own citizens that leads other groups, including in the West Bank and also in the, in the northern border by Hezbollah, to, to, to get involved. And that's incredibly, incredibly dangerous. So is there a best of all possible worlds? Yeah, the best of all possible worlds is for Hamas to surrender, as I think everybody of good heart should agree at this point. If you don't agree that Hamas should surrender, I, I doubt why. I just I, I have some serious cons questions about, about why. That uh, Again, very difficult for me to find any reason other than Jew hatred why you wouldn't want Hamas to, even for the sake of Palestinians, why you wouldn't want Hamas to go. Um, that, that would be the most obvious bill. So is Hamas going to do that? Probably not which means that it's in everybody's interest or should be in everybody's interest to depose Hamas as quickly and easily as possible. They've made it incredibly difficult. Obviously, the tunnel system, they have some 300 miles of tunnel uh, underneath the ground. They've stolen billions of dollars in order to pursue that. They've built up resources under there. It's going to be a slog. It's going to, be, it's going to take a lot longer than people think it's, it's going to take. And it's going to cost, by the end of this, it's going to cost a lot of Israeli soldiers' lives because they're going to have to attempt to go into serious urban terrain and, and, and wage this war. So I wish I saw a good way out. I don't see a good way out. I think people, you know, there are a lot of happy solutions that we tend to think about in the West, but very few of them tend to materialize in war. I suppose such are the realities of war. And as a, I just wanted to say on a personal note, as a citizen of the Czech Republic, I think we stand very firmly with Israel. I, I appreciate that. History that. Of doing so, and I hope everything is resolved as quickly as possible. And through your personal connection as well, I you know, wish you the best. With Thank you very much. Let's go to the Elected Member of Standing Committee. Hello. So you have expressed pro-life sentiments before. How can you, um, so when women with, from low-income backgrounds, often in places where abortions are illegal, I've lived in a country where abortion's been illegal, they go and people from low-income backgrounds are the ones who have to do unsafe abortions at home, who have to go into it in back in in backstreet um, vendors' places, how can you justify this as being safe for women to have just safety of, of women's health and women's rights? The argument in favor of legislation against abortion is to protect the life of the unborn. The ideal would be that people don't violate the law in order to pursue an abortion. If you violate the law in pursuit of an abortion, you're obviously violating the law. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what to say about that other than I'm not interested in women dying in back alley abortions because I'm not in favor of abortions. But women are going to have, people have abortions anyway. Abortions happen whether... Not in legal, the same numbers, I mean. Well, in, if it's just high income, uh, high income women do have the opportunity to travel abroad and have abortions, whereas it's particularly low income women who suffer the brunt of having to do at home abortions and it's unsafe and it results in people dying. Do you really think that it's safe for women's health um, to allow, well, whereas we can allow it, we can allow it in a safe facility and it can prevent women dying, it can prevent people dying in unsafe abortion places. So, I mean, we're starting from completely different premises and we're trying to reconcile the premises. So you're starting from the premise that the top priority is that a woman who violates the law to terminate her pregnancy, her safety is the number one priority. My number one priority is protecting the baby that's growing inside of her. So my answer to rich women are absconding in order to, in order to terminate their unborn child that, that when women are absconding to do that, if they're rich, my preference would be that it hit everybody equally, meaning I don't want anybody getting an abortion, rich or poor. So, the, so as far as you know, the, the second follow-on effect of that, obviously any law is going to have you know, horrible downsides. That's true of literally every law. But the question is when you're making a law with regard to, say, abortion, what are you attempting to prohibit and how many lives are you preserving in the process of doing that? Abortions yeah. are going to happen anyway. Uh, well, I mean, I, I understand that argument, but the fact is that when you make it significantly more difficult to get an abortion, fewer people get abortions. I mean, that's the entire purpose of having a law against abortion. That's why people, presumably, who are pro-choice don't want there to be laws against abortion. Yeah, uh, yeah mostly you don't want pe um, people to have laws against abortion lots of the time so that people can, you know, have them in a safe environment. But, but have them at all is sort of the first part of the sentence, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we don't have very long left, so just... Before we wrap up, I wanted to ask two final questions. Um, one of them is, um, you've, uh, this didn't come up yet in the interview, but you've been quite vocal in your uh, criticisms of the Black Lives Matter movement, 
stating that all lives matter. Um, but throughout this interview, um, you have not equally defended Palestinian lives, the civilian Palestinian lives, in the way that you have Israeli civilian, Israeli civilian lives. Um, so when it comes to Israel, Palestine, do all lives not matter then? So first off, it's a wild mischaracterization of the position that I've obviously expressed to you. You literally asked me, do I value Palestinian lives the same way I value Jewish lives? And I said, yes, I don't believe that the act of evil in targeting a Jewish child is the same as a military attempting to target a terrorist who's hiding behind a baby. So don't mistake the position, please. When it comes to the, the all lives matter position, of course I believe that all lives matter. My fundamental disagreement with Black Lives Matter is I don't agree with their premise. Their premise is that black people in the United States are being uniquely targeted by law enforcement for murder. And I don't think that the statistics prove that. I don't think the evidence is there for that. So I, I, I don't agree with the fundamental premise of the Black Lives Matter movement. Not that I don't believe that black lives don't matter. Of course black lives matter. They matter exactly the same amount as every other human life. But again, there's, there's an, I think, a willful attempt to misinterp misinterpret my position on some of these issues. Okay, thank you. And one question that we ask all of our guests um, who come here, if you could leave our members with one thing to think about, what would it be? I mean, I, I think that tonight, the, the thing that I would leave with is the same thing that I came in with, which is that there are certain values that are worth protecting. There are certain values that are worth protecting. And one of those values is the value of understanding the value of understanding clear moral differentiation, which obviously has been completely obscured. And I think tonight we've seen some evidence of people obscuring some clear moral differentiation between the targeted burning of babies in their homes in front of their mothers by shoving them in an oven and people attempting to kill terrorists who are themselves putting civilians in harm's way in violation of the rules of war and the Geneva Conventions. And if you're one of the people who's making this sort of moral equivalence, I ask for you to check your own heart. And if you're one of the people who's watching people make this moral equivalence and being convinced by the supposed complexity of the issue, I ask for you to check your brain. Thank you.